morning. Lots of you at this service, aren't there? All right. How are you guys doing today? Doing okay? Yeah? Well, I have a question for you. I would like to know what are the most important things to you, most important things that you would just not want to be separated from. What are the most important things to you? Anybody? Treats? Yes, me too. I would not want to be separated from my treats. What about you, Davey? Oh, yeah, you lost a tooth. You got separated from your tooth. Don't worry, it'll grow back. We aren't separated from our teeth very long. What do you think, Max? You wouldn't want to be separated from baseball. Cool. How about, would you guys want to be separated from your parents? No, I wouldn't either. Someone last night said that he wouldn't want to be separated from his wife. Thank goodness, right? He would, he would make sure his wife escaped a fire. So uh, what else? What about pets? Do you think you'd be sad if you were separated from your pets? Yeah, me too. Yep, and then there's some things like books or special treats or other things, baseball, the things that we do that would be really hard if we were separated from. Those are important to us. What about things like um, toys or TVs or sofas, right? These like, not, um, they're not important, are they? They're kind of nice to have, aren't they? But they're not necessarily important. Jesus teaches us today. When I have pizza, I watch a movie. When you have pizza, you watch a movie. Well, that's kind of a fun experience, isn't it? On special occasions, TV can be really nice. All right, very good. Those treats are important, I can tell. All right, Davey. You're five now? Wow. You went to five too? You were five too? Are you five? I don't know. All right. So there's lots of important things in our life, but they're not always the things that we think we can't live without. They're really important things like our relationships and our special abilities and things like that. Wait, 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 just, just a minute. And Jesus teaches us that it's important that we rest. And sometimes when we rest, it means that we can't always have all the other things we want in life. But when we rest, we can definitely have the things that we need in life because God helps provide for that. So would you guys pray with me? Dear God, we thank you so much for all the important things in our life. We thank you for um, giving them to us and helping us to trust you for those things. Help us to remember that there are things that we don't need, even though we enjoy them, and help us to remember to live our lives with what we need and not always with what we want. We pray this in your name. Amen. Please pray with me. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are, strengthen our Redeemer. Amen. Last week, we read a, um, a passage that contained a few of the parables that Jesus taught the people in this large crowd. And if you look in Mark chapter 4, you'll actually see that it is mostly parables. Um, it's full of parables that Jesus taught them, but then it also talks about how Jesus would sometimes take the disciples aside and share with them the meaning of the parables, but he actually only speaks to the larger group in parables. Um, Jesus teaches in parables, and it reminds me um, of how we teach even today. Um, teaching is exhausting. How many of you in here are teachers? A few of you, yes, and you know that's exhausting. We also learned, a lot of other parents learned how exhausting teaching was during COVID, right? Lots of parents were like, let's go back to school. Um, I come from a long line of teachers. My parents were both teachers. My grandfather was a teacher. Well, both my grandfathers taught at different points in time. My husband's a teacher. His parents were teachers. My sister-in-law's a teacher. I was trained as a teacher. So we know what teaching is all about. We know that it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to find new ways to explain things in a way that people can understand, especially harder concepts. And to figure out those ways to teach can be really tough, and it is very tiring, especially after a long day. 
And so, with this in mind, we reach our gospel today. I want to read you verses 35 and 36 to begin. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Now, there was a phrase in this passage that stuck out to me this time that hasn't ever stuck out to me before. That phrase is just as he was. It's a small little phrase, but I think it possibly has a very large meaning, just as he was. I mean, we aren't told specifically, but I would think after a long day of teaching in parables and turning aside to explain to the disciples, kind of frustrated because they should know this already, and then, um, and then speaking loud enough to where these crowds can hear him, that's physically exhausting as well. I would imagine that just as he was meant he was pretty tired, exhausted maybe even. And so instead of remaining there on the shore, probably because he wouldn't have gotten any rest, the people would have continued to want to know uh, what was going on or ask for miracles, the disciples put him in the boat just as he was, pretty tired. There were other boats with him, but the disciples put him in the boat that they were in also probably because they knew he might get better rest because they'd leave him alone. At this point, a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? First, let's talk about the stern. I don't know many things about boats, so I had to look this up myself. Um, and the stern is the back of the boat. It's not the part where you sit. Um, it's not the front. Um, it's the back, and it is often raised up a little bit higher because you're not sitting in there. Um, I like to think about it being the part of the boat that I sit on when we're kind of just bobbing along in the lake, and it's nice and peaceful. Um, and so Jesus is back in the stern on a cushion. Next, a windstorm comes up. Often when I think we think about this parable, we think about a big thunderstorm, rain, lightning. That's often, you know, we think about uh, all the things going on. And so the water's flowing into the boat. And yes, the boat was being swamped, but this was only a windstorm. It was a lot of wind, but only a windstorm. Maybe Jesus didn't feel, I mean, he's still sleeping, right? He sleeps through the whole thing. And I think maybe he doesn't feel the wind because he's sleeping in the stern. And so he's not getting swamped in the, in the part where everybody sits. But if it's that big of a windstorm and it's blowing water into the boat, you got to believe that it was blowing water onto him as well. Why would he stay asleep? Why would they have to wake him? makes me wonder, was he sleeping? Because somehow he knew, even in his sleep, that they were safe, that he could rest because he trusted that God would preserve them. Third, they asked him if he didn't care that they were perishing. Surely by now they would know that he cared. Surely. Did they not wonder why he was sleeping through it? But of course, a lot of times when we're in our own storms, it's hard to maintain calm, isn't it? After waking up, Jesus rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Be silent, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. Jesus recognizes that when the disciples are so frantic and so worried, they're not going to be able to stop worrying. They're not going to be able to sit and listen to him until things are a little bit calmer. They don't understand what's going on. So he stops the sea before he speaks to them. This was a sign of his power from God. I think, though, it's also striking that he uses the words, be silent, be still. He could have just said, stop, stop waves, stop wind. He says, be silent, be still. Of course, he was talking to the wind and the water, but it makes me wonder, was he also talking to the disciples? Be silent, be still. The wind stops and all is dead calm. Also an interesting choice of words. When the wind stopped, it is dead calm. Not just calm, but dead calm. When we stop our breath, 
We are dead. Calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? At first glance, this story seems to be about a miracle of Jesus stopping a windstorm and saving the disciples. And I do think in part it is, a great part. But I'd like to suggest that there's more to it than that based on that first little verse in phrase, or verse little phrase in verse 36, just as he was. Jesus was tired. They put him in the boat to rest, and rest he did. He fell asleep. But when the storm came up, everyone else freaked out. Everyone else was wondering, why is Jesus not doing the work of saving us from this storm? But Jesus kept sleeping. Jesus wasn't worried. Jesus had work to do, but even Jesus needed rest and trusted that God would take care of them while he was at rest. This story is not just about a storm that Jesus stills. It's a story about Sabbath, about taking time off, about resting. It's about what we really need. We are commanded to rest. The third commandment itself is keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Rest. Every seventh day we are commanded to rest. Not asked to rest, not encouraged to rest. Commanded to rest. I went to a conference one time where Nadia Boltz Weber, um, a kind of a modern time theologian, Lutheran theologian, one of my favorites, was speaking. And Nadia was challenging all of us youth ministers and talking about how we often get into this, um, this rut of I've got to do this and then I've got to do this and this is coming up and this is coming up and I've got to do this and I've got to do this. And if I don't do this, then everything's going to fall apart. And she said, if you're thinking that way and if you're just going, going, going and you're not taking a rest, then you are breaking the Sabbath. You are breaking God's commandment and you are not that important. Ooh, that was rough. But it was true. What are the things we do that keep us from rest when we really don't need to do them? When do we think we're so important that if we don't do it, everything will fall apart? And what does that say about the environment that we work in? What does this story about rest tell us about what we really need? And what does this story tell us about how we are to depend on God? I'd like to pose a new activity. Uh, when I was teaching, um, there was this consensus activity, and, and actually when I was in school, about, you know, if, you, uh, if there was a fire in your home, what are the three things you'd want to make sure you got out of the house? So I'm going to give this a little twist. Instead of um, you having to pick your family and your pets and your phone, I'm going to say that's a given, okay? So in just a minute, this is audience participation, by the way. In just a minute, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, but here we go. So your house is on fire or is about to be on fire or something's happening and you have to evacuate, maybe a hurricane, whatever, and you got your family and your pets and your phone. And somebody said last night your important paperwork, so we'll add that in too. So family, pets, phone, important paperwork, and I'll even give you a car, okay? So you can have a car. One car, not four cars like at our house. One car. So you can have family, pets, phone, identity, and a car, okay? After that, you have left. Everything else is destroyed. I want you to discuss with someone nearby you. What would you need the most at that moment that you're standing looking at a pile of rubble? What would you need the most? And what would you miss the most? Talk amongst yourselves. I'll give you 30 seconds.
Okay, I'm going to interrupt your conversation. Thank you for your participation. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and in fact, environmental studies about all living creatures on the earth, says that there are four basic needs that everybody needs. Shelter, water, food, and space. Some animals need more space than others. Um, but we all need shelter, water, food, and space. Those are the basics. Without those, the other needs um, don't really even matter. So as we think about what you're sitting and looking at, would you live in your car if everything was destroyed? Would you live at a friend's? Would you live in a shelter? Where would you eat? Would you have running water? How does having the ability to have good insurance or friends with means impact this situation? What for you would be irreplaceable? What would you miss the most? And how does this situation affect our thoughts on trusting God and caring for our neighbor so that we all have an opportunity to rest? Because we face many storms in life. That's a given. And Sabbath doesn't mean that we can't do anything about a life or death situation, right? Jesus is clear that what is necessary can be done on the Sabbath. There's sometimes some healing or whatever. But I, I question what storms are really life and death in our, in our world. Sometimes I think what we perceive as life and death really isn't as important as that. When do we worry when we really could take a break and put our burdens on God and trust God? When do we work too hard for our wants? instead of our needs. Jesus comes to teach us not only in parables, but actions. This is a story about action. This is a story in which Jesus teaches us about rest and trusting that God will take care of us. Trusting in God, trusting in Sabbath. Let's use this miracle story not just as a story about God's power, but how Christ teaches us to be still, to be calm, and to be in God's presence. Amen.